A bird's eye view of the refugee crisis. Uh, and I have the distinct pleasure of introducing the moderator for today's second panel. It's uh, Max Benavides, who is the Associate Vice President for Public Affairs and Communications at Claremont McKenna College, an adjunct professor at the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism at USC, the other school. And he was formerly at UCLA, where he held the position of Vice Chancellor of Media Relations. He's a longtime collaborator with the Chicano Studies Research Center, part of a 10-year project on the aging Latino population. And he's also the author of an important monograph on Chicano artist Gronk, uh, part of the CSRC's Aver series, which was published in uh, 2007. So uh, join me in welcoming him to panel two. Thank you, Charlene. So ha I'm so happy to be here today. I want to thank Charlene and Chon Noriega for all the work they've done uh, in putting together the, uh, the day as well as this panel. And so it's my job uh, to moderate. We have an hour and uh, we're going to have a presentation that will be the first presentation will be 15 minutes, then two 10 minute presentations, and then we'll take some questions. And uh, with the politics and policy panel is all about taking the bird's eye view, as it says on our slide, of the whole refugee crisis that's taking place here. I'm so fortunate to be on the panel with these three illustrious folks here. Roberto Lovato is a journalist, former executive director of the Central American Resource Center here in LA, and a visiting scholar at the uh, Center for Latino Policy Research at UC Berkeley. Uh, Robert Romero, an associate professor uh, here in Chicano Chicano Studies at UCLA, and Alfonso Gonzalez, who's joined us from uh, UT Austin. Uh, he's a professor at the Department of Mexican American and Latino Latina Studies and at the uh, Lozano Long Institute of Latin American Studies. So with that uh, brief intro, I'm going to turn it over to Roberto, and he's going to come up and do a presentation. And uh, thank you very much, Roberto. Thank you, Max. You haven't heard what I'm going to say yet, so thank me after. If you like it, don't, then okay. Uh, thank you to Charlene and Sean for organizing this. Uh, I'm a former bootleg chair of the Central American Studies program at Cal State Northridge. I mean, bootleg is in I did everything that a chair did except go to the bank with the same check. It's called the maquiladora that is the academy. Um, Thank you also for, uh, you know, as having that experience, that experience was made possible of creating Central American Studies because of the facilitation of Chicanos and Chicano Studies. And I like to put that up front because uh, there's a lot of discourse that runs contrary to that reality. And we need to really, really be cognizant of this. Uh, and I also want to thank you for something that is, for many of us, equally important to the, having organized this conference, which is hiring Lacey Abrego. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> He's a scholar that many of us respect and I think all of us love. So, you know, uh, hats, kudos to you. Also, by the way, just as someone who's involved in a few campaigns in my day, like campaign to get Lou Dobbs off of CNN and the campaign to get the word illegal alien out of the English language usage in major media, there's a UCLA Chicano Studies component to this. 
there's uh, Otto Santana, a linguist. I talked to Otto in the preliminary stages of developing strategy to figure out kind of the linguistics of avoiding getting on Lou Dobbs' show instead of going on the show to be humiliated. So things like that. So, you know, you're doing good things here. Uh, happy to be here. A uh, lot to talk about. Um, this conference on Central Americans in prison. Okay, let me be clear. Uh, I've interviewed the children, the mothers, many of them, and each and every single one of them uses the word prison, prisión, right? Nobody's calling it a detention center, it's, just, it's the language, and as a, somebody involved in language politics, I think that needs to be very good, they're prisons, and the reality is the, that of a prison. Um, so I'm talk about, well, this quote here is, is about, on this hand I sh is how I hope we can live here. It's a child that I met, Daniel, who has witnessed some of the more Dante-esque realities that Central America has to offer children, adults, and especially in the poor areas. This isn't happening in the gated communities of San Salvador, Tegucigalpa, or Guatemala. Um, and I think, you know, I, I put it also there, it's about Central American children and families and the real hope, as opposed to what we've had for the last eight years. Um, you know, uh, to keep our eyes on the prize. The prize is, there's always, you always have to have your eyes on a prize. If you take your eyes off a prize and you're in those jails or you're crossing that border, you're crossing through Mexico or you're in El Salvador facing or Guatemala facing some just horrific reality, you better have an eye on the prize or you're gonna get hurt or killed or something. So, and I think it applies to, we present to the public as well about these matters. So, um, so this is a story about the United States. We tend to exclude that from the narrative. You know, because conveniently the United States is excluded from the narrative of all the death in Mexico, for example. But Plan Merida is funding a good amount of the mass murder that the Mexican government's perpetrated against its own people, according to international human rights organizations. But you don't hear it in your media. I, as a journalist, kind of like to go there. So, moving along, the past today is, I'm going to introduce myself a little more and then talk about Made in the USA, USA an analysis of the catastrophic policies driving the Central American crisis. Then we'll talk about the, what I believe is the truest measure of the crisis and its solution. And that's the trauma that the human beings are carrying. And it's not just the human beings that are in jail, it's the human beings that are living in these countries and are living in these communities. Um, and then cerramos and we'll do a Q&A. A little bit more about me. Um, I was the uh, executive director of Teres and I worked in El Salvador during the conflict, so we have our own experiences of trauma and violence. Um, not as a perpetrator, for the record, people watching on the internet. And there's students here. Um, journalist, writer, uh, and I've traversed pretty much the whole journey that, not like the children and their families have, but I've gone to Carnes, I've gone through Mexico, on the trail, I've gone to the neighborhoods like this one in Ilopango uh, that are among the most affected areas in most violent areas, or like Panchimalco. I just took another trip. Panchimalco is really intense, and um, you know I applaud the conference participants because it does involve. It is an interdisciplinary reality that requires not an interdisciplinary reality. It's a it's a complex reality that requires an interdisciplinary approach. Nobody's got all the answers, not even Alfonso. So, just, I'm being Jesus, I mean, uh, I'm being Moses to his Jesus here. I'm not Moses, uh, John the Baptist to his Jesus. I'm just here to carry his water. We go back, I'm kidding. Um, so, you know, it's not him. I think, you know, I personally think having experienced some things and having talked to people who've experienced some things, I think that we're, t we, we need not just legal language and academic language, we need, we need myth, we need literary language to really comprehend what's going on on an intellectual level, and I think on a, on a physical body level too, I think that matters. Um, because you're talking about intergenerational trauma, so you need to look at the thing that makes for, say, the intergenerational trauma you have in Hamlet, in Ulysses, James Joyce's Ulysses, in the Odyssey, in the Popol Vuh, right? There's a whole line of narrative about intergenerational trauma that I think could be useful to us now because to get out of these epic problems you're going to need an epic narrative and an epic sensibility that drives people to change extremely, extremely, 
I would say dangerous if not fascistic forces that would put a child in jail for months after months after months. So, um, just trying to keep it light, you know. <laughs> um, so, first, made in the USA, an analysis of the catastrophic policy driving the Central American crisis. You have here, anybody know where this is? And those of you that who are regularly there, don't tell. Anybody know where this is? You know, you know. Anybody want to guess? It's at Carnes Jail, Crown Carnes Prison. There, there with a welcome map. So, so this is a good symbol for me of, I think, what I call the binary logic of American exceptionalism. It's a beautiful symbol that way, I'd say. Uh, in, in other words, this is about the United States as much as it is about anything. Because from a psychological perspective, if you put the whole burden of the crisis on these children and on their families, on their communities, you would destroy them. You have to have responsibilities given to the perpetrators of mass violence, the funders of mass violence, the actual systems and structures of mass violence, or you will not get change, is my thesis. So this is as much about us and you as us, as it is about them down there. And I, you know, but going down there, I, like I did a lot of this summer, you meet people like Giovanni who was deported by uh, ICE and um, on a minor drug charge and he spoke no Spanish. He had been here that long and he came here that young. He was deported back and uh, he was organizing with other deportees to try to bring their lives together and he on his own, like a buen centroamericano, just entrepreneurial and, and very driven despite it all, he um, opened up a body shop because he could do body work Above, far and beyond what most folks over there could because he had access to U.S. technology and methods and there's something to be said for U.S. technology and methods even in car auto body work so I used to do body work as a kid so we bonded on that and on low riding and uh, he rents he had he lived next to he lived in the next to in a tiny room with his wife and his child in a tiny room next to the um taller what you, the the body shop the body shop was 10 times bigger than the room that his family inhabited. And um, it for me, it provides a perfect symbol of the physical, psychic, and discursive prison that is at the heart of this crisis. Um, it's a crisis that I say is baptizing babies out of innocence, as I was talking with an indigenous leader in El Salvador. Yes, there still are indigenous people in El Salvador, believe it or not. Uh, and um, he rented a room. He also had another tiny room that he rented to this one guy who was not paying his rent. So then when he asked the guy, hey, pay me the rent, the guy said, you know, no. After two, three months, Giovanni said, okay, well, you're not going to get access. And he locked the room. And what happened to him in, in terms of El Salvador and the way they solved problems in El Salvador? Guess. He was killed. He, the guy went out, got two gang members. They went to his house in that tiny room. And you had Giovanni holding his baby when these two guys shoot him. They didn't shoot the baby, but they shot him. And that baby was baptized with his own father's blood, which for me is a, another, like a symbol of what the situation at, at the soul of these countries is facing. So it's a pressure cooker, and it's got our fingerprints from here in the United States all over it, because yesterday's communist is today's Marero. The binary logic of the catastrophe comes about in different forms. In the Cold War, it was the Cold War policy. Things like creating battalions, special rapid response battalions, batallones de infantería de respuesta inmediata, otherwise known as the killers. Post-war policy in terms of LA gang suppression, which we'll talk about, and drug war policy, and US immigration policy. That's a picture I just took, by the way, that's at the uh, forensic anthropology labs of the Medi Medicina Legal in San Salvador. Um, and that was a body of a person that had been killed earlier in the year. They get the bones and they get the bodies, the bloody bodies and everything. Different rooms for different bodies, but they have all the bodies. They have the count. So the Cold War, as many of you know, and some of you have experienced here, and I hope I don't trigger some of you. If you do, just leave the room, sincerely. We need to be conscious and cognizant of, of, uh, of, of these realities, even in this room. Right, which we honor in our book. There's a word in El Salvador that I heard was revictimizar, revictimizing. 
you know, I, I include myself. I get kind of messed up with this stuff sometimes. So, um, that's uh, uh, another body, by the way, that's from El Mosote Massacre in 19, what year was it, 80, what year was El Mosote? 82. 82, in the 80s. Um, there's also political backing by the U.S., which gave a billion dollars to the Salvadoran government to destroy the FMLN. Uh, they ended up doing, not accomplishing their goal, and they ended up destroying a lot of other people and things, including the infrastructure that made for fertile ground to gangs to grow in. Uh, they gave political backing, you know, Ronald Reagan did the American exceptional thing of, hey, you know, these are our allies, these are the moral equivalents of the founding fathers, like he was talking about the Contras in, in Nicaragua. They provided arms, they provided training at a place called the School of the Americas, and they help create and train these rapid response battalions. Batallones de Infanteria de Reacción Inmediata. BIDIS, as they're called. So I put up El, Mos El Mosote because it's, we're talking about trauma and historical trauma. And trauma in its essence is something you can't really talk about because it is unspeakably bad, right? Your consciousness can't look at the trauma you experience because you can't take repeating it. You repeat it. But you're not really like, you can't live there. So your consciousness, and you know, some psychologists will come and correct my T's and I's, but that's my general sense. It's like a ghost. It's an injury to your consciousness and your soul. Um, and it's terror-inducing psychic injury. And so Mosote is an example of, and the mass graves are symbols of, you know, of trauma, right? Because you could look at, like if we had a, some sci-fi futuristic thing, we could look at the ripple effect on a graph, like a computer thing, and look at the ripple effect of trauma, you'd see just a constant rippling out from the mass graves outward throughout the society into the consciousness, into the heart and the body. And the people that perpetrated this were trained in the School of the Americas, the leaders, and many of the things, including this man that I interviewed, who uh, is there um, with a dog that was hung by a tree in his training. He, he, was, so, he was kind of proud of his training that he, that he got. And, and one of the things they made him do was to hang a dog from a tree, cut the throat of the dog, and then put the cup below to drink the dog's blood. So this is how you make, this is what the training is about. This is the, this culture of terror, culture of violence, and I would add the culture of impunidad, impunity, because are the people that perpetrated all those mass killings in those two more minutes? Whoa, I gotta accelerate big time. Um, if, but you know, in a, if, are we surprised that we're having a lot of killing in a country that has masses of killers by the thousands running around free and normal, como si nada? So, and they were trained in the U.S. and that's a map of um, of all the mass graves that are. And they all have this thing that says uh, "No investigado." Most of the uh, mass graves and the killings in El Salvador. Uh, have not been investigated from that period. So the legal system is broken and everybody knows it. So you can take somebody out, like they took Giovanni out, pay $50, $100, problem solved. This is the, and you know, this is a, a, also from the forensic lab, this is a machete strike from a victim from El Mosote. I also saw skulls in the present time that had the same kind of weaponry, the same methods of killing. These are cultural facts, right? The methods are part of the culture, right? And so this is how you have uh, this knowledge and these practices transferred from one generation to the next, these ideas, and this, it's really complex. It's more complex than your media is telling you. And in Hermosote, they killed women, children, and elderly primarily. Um, and so you also have the US uh, approach to gangs, I mean, the, where were the gangs born? In LA, I was at Caresen when I first started hearing about Mara um, Salvatrucha. We had young people coming to our youth program telling us about these gangs that we'd never heard about, and then they're being pursued and kind of brought into them. And when somebody tries to do something about it, like Alex Sanchez, is Alex here? All right, well, Alex will be here. Yeah, you know, like, talk to Alex. He tried to create a gang truce. What happened to Galax? He was put in jail, he was attacked, they tried to deport him. There was a big movement to try to kind of save him from this. 
and it worked. You know, and you know, we can get things done. Uh, not just you know, all of us together. So um, the peacemakers. I mean, they're 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 killing peace. They're jailing peace. They're very clear on their policies. So when you see what's happening at Carnes or anywhere else, this is a culture in this country, a policy structure that lives and breathes this kind of approach. Because look at what they're doing with the drug war. You know, by any other name, Obama's continuing the drug war and expanding it. Like, you know, there was super mano dura in a previous administration, then there's a super mano dura, and now, um, you know, he's, they're, they're, they're adopting these rapid response battalions again that were dismantled during the war. That's the solution to the gang problem, is the, of the FMLN. The people that they were trying to destroy are now allied with the U.S. in terms of the gang problem. It's irony. Our history really is ironic. That's why this stuff is like the stuff of literature. Um, so all these policies have many Salvadorans in particular, which is where I spend a lot of my, my, my focus, to give a Salvadoran peace sign to the president when he visited. That's a young journalist that gave a Obama the peace sign from himself. Anybody know what this means? Mabe. Mabe. Well, I, we can talk about it later, because if you actually knew, you'd probably like laugh like she is. Um, Mabe. It means, well, we'll talk about it. <laughs> Frenemies and frames of war. So the United States now has what I would call a frenemy relationship with the government of El Salvador. They agree on a U.S. military approach to the gangs, a expansion of the rapid response battalions. Uh, they oppose the gang truce, and like they don't let the gang truce, the peacemakers from El Salvador, come to the U.S. Like the Alex Sanchez's of El Salvador can't come to the United States. They're denied visas. Uh, the U.S. sends trainers. There are U.S. trainers right now training the Salvadoran military, and may the, the you get the results. El Salvador climbs to be the singularly single most violent place on the in the planet in May. So the truest measure, though, is the people, and you know the, the gang members are walking, talking traumas. That there's a traumatic root of this. It's not even part of the discussion. They're denying the humanity of the gang people. Not every gang member is a killer to start with. The majority you know, are, are, are engaged in violence, but not all of them are brutal killers like some of them are. You know, they're, they're just like, you know, some people in the U.S. government are not killers, but some of them really are. Um, so, the psychologists talk about pre-migration, peri-migration, and post-migration trauma. Post-migration being the time in jail that I was told by some psychiatrists that it actually affects the brain of the child to be in jail for over two weeks. So there's been kids that have been further for months. Um, and this is something that, by the way, not just the piñata of Donald Trump, but this is something that Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama agree on, this policy on the children. So you might consider having other piñatas in the future at a Central American conference. <laughs> so let me skip that and just you know, leave it there because I have, but leave you with, 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 with the effects which are stomach aches, headaches, insomnia, lack of concentration. This is in El Salvador, but it's also in Carnes, right? And this is an awesome quote from an awesome woman who's the inheritor of the liberation psychology um, tradition of El Salvador, of Ignacio Martin Baro, one of the Jesuits that was killed in 89. She says, violence feeds more violence and adds to a false sense of victory. Yes, there is violence, but this is not a war. Everything in the media, the politicians, the, even some scholars are applying the frame of war to a situation that's a criminal justice and social justice and social sociology, anthropology, different kind of issue, not an issue of war. So, be a, a conclusion, without justice or reparation, people will continue living trapped on both sides who control the means of violence, trapped in traumas layered on other traumas. Because there's a deep layer that goes even beyond the war in El Salvador, and we can talk about that over cocktails. Uh, of course, it has to the United and, and the, the people in El Salvador are calling for justice from the United States. Because if the United States was a person, what it did in Central America would be would be a, a, a person that committed crimes against humanity and would be brought to justice. So we need to start repairing, like maybe even creating a reparations movement for Central Americans. Um, so that we don't have to, you know, have this be the reality, because this is the gang picture that a child drew, but that we have this. 
I hope we can live here. I hope we can live a peaceful life. Thank you. Thank you, Alberto. That was, that was pretty intense, but I think what you see is some of the images that he showed. We, we don't see those images here in the United States in our media. So thank you for sharing those with us. They're, they're tough and they're intense. And now I'd like to bring up uh, Alonso from uh, UT Austin. So, you know, you can see, read his bio in the uh, document here. You bring up my presentation. Thank you, because I don't have a lot of time. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go uh, uh, quickly. I always go quickly, but in this time I'm gonna actually move uh, uh, faster than usual. The name of this talk is Dead on Arrival, Mesoamerican Asylum Claims in the Era of Authoritarian Neoliberalism. Uh, I wanna emphasize that what's happening is not just happening to children, it's not just happening to Central Americans. We have a new generation of forced migrants, of refugees from Mexico and Central America that are fleeing uh, a neoliberal security paradigm that's in crisis, that's creating mass violence upon our communities. So I have that picture, of course, of Alex Sanchez, who we all know, uh, but also Belvira Arellano. Most people don't know Belvira Arellano came back and applied for asylum here in the United States because of the situation of violence in Mexico. Uh, the vast majority of Mexican and Central American asylum cases are denied. About 7% of Guatemalans win their cases. Only about 6% of Salvadorans win their cases and only about 1% of all Mexican asylum cases are granted in the immigration court. And I know we've heard some successful stories of uh, attorneys and, and experts, I, I, I do expert witness work myself, winning cases, but we have to recall that those victories are a drop in the bucket uh, uh, when you look at the vast majority of people who were denied. So the real question is, why are people denied? Uh, who are the forces that are responsible for this? And what does this tell us about the politics of migration control, race, and democracy today. Migration control, race, and democracy. We'll come back to that at the very end. And I want to I want to start off with uh, a brief understanding. Why is this Why is this talk called Dead on Arrival? Uh, it's Dead on Arrival because you got to look at the, the the history of the Refugee Convention. The Refugee Convention in 1951 was built for a very particular type of European refugee. It wasn't until 1967 that the Refugee Convention had a protocol that actually adjusted it and said that it can now be applied to people throughout the globe. Uh, before, it was optional to apply it to non-Europeans. Okay? So we got to see that refugee law from the very beginning is, is Eurocentric. And for the vast majority of me dark-skinned Mexican and Central American refugees, right, our cases are dead on arrival because we have already suffered a social death, racialized rightlessness in the United States because of who we are. The asylum regime was never meant for us. Uh, and it, it wasn't until 1967, during the time of the civil rights movement, that there was an effort to try to bring the spirit of civil rights to international refugee law and say this should apply to everyone equally, okay? But the same way there was a backlash against the civil rights, move, uh, civil rights legislation uh, in the United States, there was also a backlash against the 1967 protocol and a backlash against refugee rights. The last semi-progressive uh, refugee bill in this country is in 1980 with Jimmy Carter uh, when they signed the 1980 Refugee Act, okay? Which brings the spirit of the 1951 convention and makes it US law, okay? But by 1981, Ronald Reagan's elected and this entire uh, conservative counter-revolution emerges to begin to undo refugee protections for the global south, for migrants, forced migrants, for refugees from the global south. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but starting in 1980, Reagan's the one that says, and particularly with Central Americans, we're gonna detain them. Before Reagan came in power, if you were a refugee, uh, uh, you were applying for, I like to use the word refugee versus asylum seeker, and we can get into that later, there's a big debate about that, but, but part of the, of the hegemony on this question is that we don't even call people refugees, we call them asylum seekers. When in fact, what we see are people being displaced and they're seeking refuge from violence that we help to create, okay? Uh, it's much like the debate over the term illegal alien versus undocumented. Uh, uh, we're dealing with refugees, folks, okay? Uh, and one of the first things that Reagan does, he begins to detain people uh, uh, and hold them in detention centers to prevent them from, uh, uh, as a deterrent to uh, prevent them from uh, uh, gaining refugee status uh, legally. And then you can see 
from the 1980s moving forward, uh, there's every, uh, uh, throughout the, the entire 1980s, there's efforts to continue to undo uh, um, refugee protections. In 1996, we see further, uh, further uh, uh, violence to the refugee protection system through the 1996 immigration laws. That was woven in there by nativist groups in Washington, D.C. They had a very, very specific bone to pick with Central American refugees. I got a quote from John Tanton reflecting on the refugee crisis of the, I won't call it refugee crisis, reflecting on the refugee situation of the 1980s and saying, these are Salvadoran communists, these are not refugees, we need to send these people back. This is like 1984, 1986, when John Tanton, who's the founder of uh, Federation for American Immigration Reform, the Center for Immigration Studies, I mean, this is a really nativist, anti-immigrant, anti-refugee, anti-Latino think tank. They're, they've been saying this since the 1980s. Uh, and then in September 11th, uh, you, you, after September 11th, you don't see new legal tools to undo the, the refugee uh, uh, regime, the, the refugee protections, but you see a new political will to begin to, you see a new political will to deny people uh, uh, their, their rights as, as refugees. The 2005 Real ID Act has, uh, has components in there that make it extremely difficult for people to win their cases, as does the 1996 immigration laws, which impose a one-year bar for applying for uh, uh, asylum in the United States, and I won't go into the specifics, but there's a whole set of legal gymnastics uh, that from the 1980s moving forward to undo the system of refugee protections, okay? Um, and this is something that's been pushed by not just groups operating at the level of the state, but offer, uh, operating also in civil society. Uh, and I'm currently finishing another book on, on this topic, uh, and one of the things I talk about is the role of the Center for Immigration Studies in undoing the system of uh, refugee protections. Uh, here's a quote from one of the, uh, Dad, Dad Kadman, who is uh, actually a former INS official who became a fellow for the Center for Immigration Studies, and he says, some of the ways in which past abuse has been curbed were through, were through the institutions of a careful regime of barriers to the final achievement of asylum to discourage malified or frivolous cases. The barriers include detention of arriving applicants. Dan Kadman is advocating for the continued detention of uh, uh, people who are applying for asylum. He's a former INS director who becomes now really a policy fellow for this anti-refugee, uh, anti-immigrant, anti-Latino think tank, okay? Um, Center for Immigration Studies and many of these groups push a particular type of thinking that's one that continues to restrict uh, uh, rights for, for refugees, okay? All of that has led to a tightening of the immigration court system that makes it almost 95% likely that you're not gonna win your case, okay? And we're talking about maybe 5% of Mexican and Central Americans together uh, win their cases. And why is that, right? It's because of this really, I, I see the laws that I, the, the changes to the laws since 1980 that I'm talking about, I see that as the mining of the refugee regime. They've basically created a series of legal minds that easily disqualify anyone from uh, uh, winning their case. I shouldn't say anyone, but most people. Uh, in fact, immigration court, uh, we tend to look at immigration court as if it's independent from the larger migration control apparatus, but immigration court is in fact another site for the legal production of migrant illegality, as Nick DeGeneva would say. It's another site of migration control. But the difference is that in immigration court, you are given the appearance of being able to present your case before the court and make a case for yourself. But the vast majority of folks still lose. Immigration court is also a site of asymmetrical conflict that reflects the hierarchies of the colonial matrix of power. I mean, you go immigration court, what I'm trying to tell you is you'll have indigenous women who speak a native language defending themselves through a translator who's in translating you know, from Guiche to Spanish, and someone's translating from Spanish to English in some cases without an attorney, uh, and, and you're, you're, it's an asymmetrical site of conflict where some of the poorest and most marginalized communities in the continent have to face a Harvard or Yale trained immigration lawyer uh, in a courtroom that is, that is already a highly racialized and intimidating space. It's intimidating for me as a professor with a PhD to give my testimony in immigration court and imagine the vast majority of folks. I always remember a case here in Los Angeles where a Salvadoran man could not speak and he was, all he could say was, no puedo hablar por mis nervios. And his eyes were red in tears. 
and the court, the judges, even his attorney was telling him, come on, you need to speak. It's a racialized and violent space that represents this hierarchy of power. It does not escape that, okay? Most importantly, the immigration courtroom doesn't escape the neoliberal logic that governs our society, folks. I, I, I love working with immigration attorneys and I love working in the immigration court, but I don't know how many times where we were, and I'm guilty of this myself, where we're like, oh, that's a good case. But the, the vast majority of folks should be considered bona fide refugees as a collective group, right? This good case, bad case, it's part of the neoliberal logic that's based on meritocracy. So why is it that the woman that has three, you know, her kid and her brother killed in El Salvador, she has a good case, but the 14 year old that hasn't had a family member killed yet, but who's been threatened, has a bad case, right? This is part of the meritocracy that's brought on to these cases and it's something that we have to challenge folks, okay? The idea that only the good cases should win and that there should be all these protections to weed out the bad cases is part of this hegemonic neoliberal logic, right? It's the moral and intellectual leadership of conservative nativist anti-migrant forces has been so naturalized that now if you compare the discourse of the Obama administration with the Center for Immigration Studies, they have the same position on the Central American uh, uh, refugees. Their position is, Center for Immigration Studies, the ultra right wing think tank says, we need to deport them and detain them to prevent people from coming. And that's exactly what the Obama administration is arguing. In fact, this gentleman right here to the right, Leon Fresco, he is one of the architects of comprehensive immigration reform. He was Senator Schumer's right hand man on immigration policy. This is a liberal, this is a you know, quote unquote liberal who's, who's ended up arguing the, posi the same position of, of, uh, of a Latino, a Cubano, uh, uh, who's arguing the same position of the, the ultra right wing forces, right? There's a consensus within the state and civil society actors that what we need to do is detain people as a deterrent to prevent people from coming uh, to the United States. I'm not gonna talk about the detention centers because people have talked about that enough, but I wanna say that we need to challenge this hegemonic discourse about good cases versus bad cases and begin to think about not just ending family detention, but ending state violence against communities. I've interviewed many, many people in Carnes, uh, several dozen, and I know several families that have, is, have, have left Carnes, and the violence hasn't stopped against them. Uh, it's not like they've gotten out of Carnes and everything has been great. I mean, of course, they should be released from Carnes, but state violence against brown folks is something that we need to challenge. We need to challenge this uh, in ways that I think some of the discourse about ending family detention misses, right? So for instance, many of the families that are released are being put on ankle bracelets. Uh, I know one woman who had to pay a $10,000 bond to ICE. She had to pay a $10,000 bond and then she had to pay her attorney six, you know, four to six thousand dollars, and now they got to pay four hundred dollars a month to have this ankle bracelet on them. There are bond companies here in Adelanto and in, and in Los Angeles that are, are giving people ankle bracelets as part of their bond. It's a, it's become a major business. That is further violence against communities. Okay, we need to begin to challenge this racial state violence against. Latino refugees and change the discourse of the current debate. And as much as I like and participate in many of the legal strategies, this also has to become a social movement that's outside of the legal arena. Uh, Nikos Polanza said that the law is the open state secret. It's the language of the state, but it's you have to be trained to understand it. It's an open secret. And as long as we keep this focused into a legal discourse, uh, many people uh, who would normally be part of a social movement will sit back and wait for the courts to decide when in fact, even with this injunction, we still have 3,000 people detained in, in our courts, in our, in our detention centers in, uh, in Texas. Furthermore, the narrow legalistic discourse obfuscates the neoliberal state project in Latin America, in particular Mexico and Central America, that's at the heart of the displacement of people from these communities. I won't talk further about this because Roberto talked about U.S. foreign policy, but I want to name, uh, I, wanted, I don't want to, I don't want, I want to name just part of it. It's not just NAFTA, it's not just CAFTA, it's the neoliberal economic model that was imposed since the early 1980s 
unto this region that has continued to displace people through numerous policies, but ultimately it reflects a particular type of logic, an ideological logic that was institutionalized into law. Okay. Um, I also wanna, I want us to pull back a little bit, and I said my have one more slide after this. I want us to pull back a little bit, and and think about family detention, the detention of Latino refugees as part of a of a deeper and more troubling authoritarian turn in contemporary neoliberalism. It's an authoritarian turn that threatens to undo uh, uh, not just uh, the system of uh, refugee rights and protections for, uh, for folks from the global south, but that even threatens to undo even the most basic elements of liberal democracy. Uh, and, and liberal democracy is imperfect. It was designed for a certain type of, of body. It was, it's, it's always been imperfect. But this authoritarian turn that we're moving to is represented by, uh, by folks like John, by Donald Trump. But also, if you look at Hillary Clinton and her discourse, she says we should deport all these kids. She's not for any special protections for these families. That is part of this authoritarian logic that has come to embody politics in this society. Uh, uh, and it's, it's much deeper than just migration control. It's, it's something that we see in everything from crime control, uh, the discourse about urban control after uh, some of the uprisings that we saw in Baltimore, in um, St. Louis, in uh, Ferguson, etc. It's part of this authoritarian turn that's very, very troubling. But with that said, I also think that that's what makes the movement for Latino refugee rights so important. And I want to emphasize Latino refugee rights with all respect to my Central American co-conspirators, colegas, compañeros. Uh, it's important to have a Central American space. So I totally respect that. But I also want us to think about how uh, Mexicans are also denied their cases and to the dominant society, to Trump, and to many of his supporters and even people like Hillary Clinton, refugees from the global south, starting from Tijuana South, uh, don't have a case. Our cases are already dead from the very, very beginning. Uh, and I think there's, there's possibilities of uniting what's, what, uh, 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 what I see as a burgeoning Mesoamerican refugee movement. Okay. And I think this movement is very, very important because it has genuine organic intellectual leadership in the refugee women themselves, right? I mean, you know, people talk about um, the, uh, the injunction and people talk about the hunger strike, but none, you know, none of that would have happened if it wasn't for the leadership of some of these women. I had the honor of meeting and working with some of these women. This is actually a, a, a painting of one of the um, key uh, women in, who was at Carnes. Uh, and they have a she has a tremendous, tremendous uh, intellectual capacity and ability to organize. Without that, we would have e we would have not even seen the type of exposure that we did see about the atrocities at Carnes. Um, I also think that the Latino refugee movement or the incipient Latino refugee movement it exposes the limits of this idea of comprehensive immigration reform. Comprehensive immigration reform as it, the way it was conceived in its last iteration under uh, Senate Bill 744, which was the Gang of Eight Bill, it would have done very little to actually improve uh, the, the refugee uh, uh, regime. In fact, it would have expanded detention centers, it would have created more resources for detaining folks. Um, another important thing about this movement is it unmasked the racial politics of national and international rights regimes. Okay? We, have to, we have to confront the racial politics of this head on. If those were French children who were, were, were fleeing, uh, uh, I don't know, terrorists in, in, uh, in France, we wouldn't have been detaining them. We need to, a lot of people want to sidestep that, but we need to take those racial politics very, very serious. Uh, and that begins, that's going to force us to think about a new way of making rights claims. Okay, because the international, uh, international human rights law, refugee law, refugee law it's raced. Even if it doesn't openly claim to be raced, it has an origin that excluded the brown body. Uh, and until we confront that and think of new ways of making rights claims that are based on recognition, and I think me and Roberto are, are, are kind of seeing, uh, are kind of converging on this, uh, I, I suggest that we move on a new type of rights claim that's based on recognition, on recognizing our responsibility in the gang situation in Central America, in recognizing our responsibility for the neoliberal project and the narco uh, uh, situation in Mexico, 
our responsibility for restructuring these economies in such a way that it would benefit us, benefit us economically, but it would destroy the social fabric of these communities. Until we recognize that and repair that, and recognize the racialized nature of, of, the, of the tools that we have to fight for refugee rights, then I think that we're gonna be uh, um, making small and important victories, maybe on individual cases, but not as a collective uh, uh, that's capable of making structural transformations. Uh, and I wanna say one last point, that this will never be done alone by, by academics, by policy people, by lawyers, as much as I value what we do, uh, we have to take the lead of refugees themselves. Uh, there's a great quote from Hannah Arendt. It actually comes from a different context, but I think it's still very important. And she said that refugees represent the vanguard of their people. And when I think of this brilliant and brave woman who risked everything in Carnes, for me, that's the kind of person I want in this society. She represented to me the vanguard of Central American refugees today, uh, and luckily for her, uh, many women are out at that detention center. And we can't build a movement to confront this without the participation of those colegas in this struggle. Thank you. Thank you, Alfonso. And now our last speaker, Robert Romero, will you please come up? Thanks. Thank you very much, Roberto and Alfonso. Uh, it's a privilege to be here, uh, especially as, as a Mexicano, to speak as a, as a friend of the Central American community. And I'm humbled to thank you for this opportunity to share. My brief comments will come from the perspective of legal history, basically. So I'm going to kind of talk a little bit about the Central American Miners Program and then speak a little bit about. Central American organizing in the 80s and 90s, which led to some effective uh, migration policy change. My thesis is that migration policy typically bows to politics, but, here's the key thing, politics bows to effective grassroots community organizing, coupled with lawsuits. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right? That, that's the pattern of like the 1980s, right? when Nakara passed and Nakara and, and different things. Um, in the, the current Central American Miners Program, or CAM, you see a, a clear example of migration policy bowing to politics. It's a half-hearted effort, um, at least, you know, to, to say the least. Um, this, as, as you know, those of you in this room know, um, CAM was a response to the, the large Central American child refugee um, crisis right of last summer, and in response, the Obama administration um, created CAM, but it really impacted small numbers of, of relative small numbers of, of, of individuals. Um, CAM only provides refugee status to someone who has a qualifying parent already in the U.S. who has a green card or who has temporary protected status or perhaps even, even DACA, but that's a very limited category of people. The vast majority of Central American child refugees and families do not have a qualifying relative. So it looks good on paper, like it looks good for the 24 hour news cycle, but it, in reality it does not impact um, very many people. On top of that, right, the limit on refugees coming from Latin America, all of Latin America and the Caribbean in 2015 is only 4,000. Right. So even four, that, that's for the whole Latin America. So even if 4,000 people qualified for CAM, which is not the case, um, you still have tens and tens of thousands of, of families and children who do not. To give you an example, um, I read some recent statistics that stated that more than 61,000 family units have crossed the U.S. border and 51,000 unaccompanied children. So again, even if CAM was maxed out and all 4,000 slots went to, went to Central America, which was not gonna happen, you see how it's just a real drop in the bucket. 
So again, in my perspective, Kim is just a political piece of shit. Sorry. <laughs> right? it's, it's, it's just like, it's just half-hearted. That's what it is, right? Um, another example of, 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 of lack of political will has to do with the area of temporary protected status. Temporary protected status. Now, TPS is not the best, right? As we know from decades of experience with it. But it's, it's something, and it was definitely an option for the Obama administration to grant temporary protected status to Central American refugees and their families. That was an option. The criteria for granting TPS uh, involves ongoing armed conflict, an environmental disaster, or other extraordinary and temporary conditions. Clearly, this crisis falls under one of those categories. And yet, the only way that you can qualify for TPS, let's say if you're from El Salvador, is if you continuously resided in the US since 2001. Right? So that's old. Right? So again, that is, Again, another example of the lack of political will, half-heartedness. Uh, by way of my, my third sort of point is to examine from a, a very brief legal history perspective the last time in which um, broad policy change was affected uh, in terms of migration policy in the Central American community. Uh, so in, in the 80s, as Alfonso discussed and Roberto um, you had the denial of you know, thousands and thousands of asylum cases by the U.S. government because the U.S. government was supporting the, the regimes in Central America that were, that were causing people to flee and, and so for, for many years. Um, the Reagan administration was denying um, asylum claims, right, just en masse. That led the immigrant community itself to organize, right? And one um, example of that or organizing was the sanctuary movement, the sanctuary movement, where uh, Central American immigrants said, wait a minute, our due process rights are being violated, and we need to do something about this. And what they did was they reflected upon their religious background and said, okay, there is this concept, religious concept, called the cities of refuge in, in the Old Testament, whereby if someone was accused of manslaughter, someone could run to the city of refuge so that they weren't just killed in immediate retribution. And in that city of refuge, they could um, be guaranteed or, or, or somewhat guaranteed um, due process. So, the, so um, the immigrant community said, wait a minute, that's like us in the US. We're being denied due process. We come here, we're fleeing all this violence. Our asylum claims are being denied without proper due process. So, so many immigrants organized through churches, and, and churches received sort of uh, physical sanctuary, as well as uh, right to legal counsel and, and had other, other physical needs met. Um, and that sanctuary movement gave rise, in part, to a uh, really historic case called American Baptist Churches versus Thornburg. American Baptist Churches versus Thornburg. From, which was decided in 1991, but it was a five-year five -year fight. Um, and basically, in, the, in a nutshell, in that case, immigrants argued that, hey, our due process rights are violated. We have not, instead of deciding our asylum claims based upon a proper and fair review, what's happening is that our asylum cases are being decided because of foreign policy reasons, right? Or the desire to secure the border, right? And the amazing thing was, the Central American immigrant community won. <laughs> and the Thornburg case allowed for the re-review of thousands of, of Central American asylum cases and led a number of several years later to NACADA, the Nicaraguan Adjustment and Central American Relief Act in 1997. And that, NACADA, as many of you know, um, allowed for, for many, many individuals to receive legal permanent residency status. Right? It's amazing. Right? So again, this pattern of, of um, migration policy bowing to um, politics, the community itself organizing, through those organizing efforts, um, legal efforts ensuing, and change really happening. 
And so I hope that that, that might be a historical lesson that might be of some encouragement to us. And uh, yeah, thanks so much. What a great panel. And uh, you know, there's so much to say. We have so little time. We've got four minutes left. Uh, we're going to take two questions, and I'll have to cut you off when we go, but if you have a question, please raise your hand and ask whichever one of the panelists you'd like to ask a question of. Anybody have a question for our panelists today? Yes. So, um, it was really great, thank you. Um, Alfonso, your presentation helped to crystallize for me something that I've been kind of um, stressing about for a while now um, as, a, as a tension, um, and I want to see what you think if I kind of put it in these terms. So on the one hand, you're insisting um, that these are refugees, um, and I also said in my talk, you know, these are refugees, and here's the proof is that, you know, we're winning some of the claims. Um, but, it, but in your presentation, you also made the point that no, in fact, we're losing most of the, of the claims. Um, and so, um, are we better off describing them as refugees who just aren't being properly recognized by the system, um, or are we better off, or are we better off trying to do what I tried to do and say, no, they're refugees, and in fact, look, the system is recognizing them, and so we need to um, try to treat them as the refugees that the U.S. government itself recognizes, or do we sort of need to think about going beyond all of that and, and recognizing the limitations of the refugee definition, whether it's under US law or under international law, as you pointed out, the limitations of the convention itself, and really think of a different way. I mean, you suggested the kind of reparations recognition approach. Um, it could be um, a recognition of them just being forced migrants. There's been some talk about that in the literature. Or is it really even something broader than, than that that we're really trying to get? But I guess what I'm wondering is, is it a bit of a vicious circle to say, no, they're really refugees, but look how they're not being recognized, and how do we kind of get out of that circle? By what definition are they refugees if they're not being recognized by the, all the systems in place as refugees? That's an excellent question. I think there's a, a practical element. like. One thing is working on someone's individual case and being in immigration court and calling them an asylum seeker before a judge. I understand why we have to do that, and I do it all the time. Um, on the other hand, there's the question of, of, I don't really think it's a matter of what we call it until we build the political power and organizational infrastructure in order to make whatever definition we come up with mean something. Uh, there's a great quote from Gramsci that I, that I always use, and he says, the decisive element in every historical conjuncture is a well-organized fighting force that is full of fighting spirit. And I don't think, until we have the type of social movement that uh, Professor Noriega was talking about, um, political and social movement in place, that then it's, the, we're not gonna be able to make any of those definitions really matter until we have that force. But it is it is a vicious cycle, and I and I recognize that 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 we all, to a certain degree, play into it. Great. One more question. Yes. So there's really really great conversations taking place up there. Thanks. I guess how do we? So I think the Central Amer the first Central American refugee crisis in the '80s helped reset the U.S. asylum law, right? And now we're I think we have an opportunity again, right? So we just looked at the statistics, right? And so right now, I think the new statistics, like some of the stuff that um, Denise and I are seeing, like we're winning cases, right? How can we take, like, I think it would be great at the end of this sort of movement that we have reset asylum law again so that everyone, like in Mexico, Central America, Latin America, qualifies for asylum if we want that, right? If that's the, where we want to go. But I guess, how do you create, how do you take this, this immigration court like dynamic that takes place really behind closed doors and tell the stories outside of it. Like I just don't, how, I can't do, how do you do that? Can I, I just, I, I hate to hog up the mic, but I just want to say one thing. 30 seconds. We don't have a refugee, we don't have a refugee crisis. We have a, we have a crisis of rights, right? This is not a refugee crisis. This is a right, a, a, a crisis of 
ra uh, racialized rightlessness, and it's not new. It's been around for 500 years. It just has different, it, it has ebbs and flows. And we're at a particular moment where we might be able to make some particular gains. You know, another ABC case, for instance, that opens the door for, for other refugees from Mexico or other parts of Latin America. But at the end of the day, we need to confront the, 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 the state of racialized rightlessness. Great. Thank you. That's all we have time for. <laughs> Okay, we have a couple of minutes break while we get the next panel ready. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.